you to kick in. <laughs> Have you had a nice visit here? Oh, nice. Oh, oh, really nice. Oh, I love that. Great. Wow. The weather should be nice. You missed the big rainstorm. It was horrible Saturday. Yeah, we have just, we had a, two events on Saturday, and it was like, it was awful. But, yeah, but it looks like good weather carrying. Where do you live? Oh, okay. So, yeah, definitely better. <laughs> Got it. I can certainly see that. Yeah. Right. Where, which one are you at? Right. Well, that's an excellent point. Which resort are you staying in? Oh, sure. Yeah. No, I know where it is. Absolutely. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, while we're waiting for whatever is going on in the back room there to get started, let me say, first of all, thank you. I'm going to have to repeat some of this for the virtual audience. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. We are um, too early for Hanukkah and too late for Thanksgiving, so we're kind of in a, <laughs> a sweet spot here. Hanukkah is late this year, isn't it? It's like the 18th to the 26th, I think. My husband is Jewish, and you know, but he knows nothing whatsoever about <laughs> celebrating... Jewish holidays, and when we travel, it's hilarious. He he likes to photograph stained glass. So we've gone all around Europe. I haven't missed a single synagogue or a single um, synagogue museum, and he has not missed a single cathedral. And so often we split, like in Dubrovnik, and he's off to Dubrovnik, you know, to photograph the glass, and I'm wandering around in the Jewish museum at the at the synagogues. And I think actually the museums attached to most of those. Um, Synagogues are extraordinary. I've even been in the one, the first one in the Americas, which is, I don't remember which island in the Caribbean. I, I don't, I don't know, I, it'll come to me. But anyway, six, it's 16th century, it was a shipwreck occasion, and the people landed, landed on the island. It had sand on the floor, and it had this really cool, the, the graveyard, um, the gravestones, or whatever they are, the markers, have been deteriorating under climate change. This was quite a while back. And so they brought them, the headstones, to the museum and lined them all up. And my absolute favorite is they had this wonderful man. He had on, you know, the great the great calf, like a yarmulke, but more conical. Um, and he's in a chariot being drawn up by the sun. And over the side of the chariot, he's going, it's just so great. <laughs> I have photos of it somewhere, but um, I didn't realize that that was the first synagogue in the Western Hemisphere, and it was there largely by accident, you know, because of the shipwreck brought, brought people to get there. And I don't think I've been in another one that has sand on the floor. But I have been in them in Budapest. I've been in the entire one in Prague. I've been in, um, in Venice. Um, St. Petersburg, Dubrovnik, practically everywhere. And I usually take photos and send them to my friend Jonathan Kellerman, who um, the Kellermans, Jonathan and Faye, are authors, and they're orthodox. And so I frequently send them um, photos from abroad. It's even um, Cape Town. Cape Town has a terrific synagogue with a gorgeous flame tree right outside. So I'm a synagogue tourist. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Love it. Pat, are you having some kind of a problem? Oh, well, if we're live on YouTube, we'll just carry on so you won't think we're crazy. In any case, what a pleasure it is to meet Stephen Hartoff, uh, who has wonderful credentials for writing The Last of the Seven, which better he should acquaint you with than I should pronounce. So, Stephen? Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Um, the Last of the Seven, my most recent novel, is the second part of a World War II series, which began with a book called The Soul of a Thief. And The Soul of a Thief came out of some experiences of my own family during World War II. Mm -hmm. So my background is uh, that I you know, was, grew up as a typical kid, and a Jewish kid in Connecticut. 
I wound up joining the U.S. Merchant Marine. Then I wound up in the Israeli Army as a paratrooper and uh, in special operations. And eventually, I, I just retired from the New York Guard as a major. But that first book, The Soul of a Thief, was based upon a great uncle of mine. My mother's an Austrian uh, refugee from the Nazis. And most of the family died over there. But I had a great uncle who was what uh, what is termed a, a Mischling, which is a half Jewish and half Christian fellow. And uh, he decided, Uncle Alexander, that the best way to hide from the Nazis was to join the Luftwaffe. So he joined the German Air Force. And uh, he lasted for about 14 months before they figured it out and sent him to a concentration camp. And uh, But he survived, which is how I knew his whole story. So Uncle Alexander's story became the focal point for The Soul of a Thief, which uh, is about a half-Jewish-Austrian kid who winds up serving at the feet of a German colonel right before D-Day in Normandy. So thereafter, the, the characters that appear at the very end of that book became the lead characters for this book, which is also based on a lot of true history. Almost everything in this book is uh, true in one way or another. And it's about the German and Austrian Jews who became British commandos and went back to fight the Nazis, first in North Africa and later in the European theater. But they, because of their language skills and their backgrounds, they, they were all orphans. All of their families had been killed, but they donned Nazi uniforms and they were trained to fight the Nazis and infiltrate um, the Nazis in, in that way. And they were very brave young men because they knew that if they were caught, they were going to be executed if they were lucky and probably tortured and executed first. Now, the North African theater was a really brutal theater. You describe it very well. I mean, not that I was there, but I was alive then. So, you know, you'd think I could remember it, but no. Um, there was um, that whole thing between Rommel and Montgomery eventually culminated in the Allies recovering North Africa and used it as the launch pad for invading Sicily. Correct. Which is part of your, you know, your your storyline. But um, I thought part of what was so surprising in the book was um, was how these young men learned to speak perfect British because many Britons, many of the British can't speak perfect British. <laughs> um, it's it's a very, you know, difficult language to get exactly right. That sort of Oxford, Cambridge, whatever it mm -hmm. is. Did they go for that kind of upper crust British or did they go for a more practical British or they didn't go for an upper crust British because they were they were pulling uh, German and Austrians uh, into the British Army and they really wanted them for their German skills. But a lot of them uh, first served in British units, particularly in what was then Palestine. So they would serve with like the Scots Guards and so forth. And and um, their English was good, but accented. And so the, the Brits, it wasn't important to the Brits as much that these German boys and Austrian boys speak or fit into the British sort of cultural norms because they needed them to speak fluent German. And so that's what they were used for. The, the special interrogation group in North Africa, the, the Germans and the young Austrians and Germans, were trained in German uniforms and the, with all of the manners and mannerisms and, and habits of the German army. And then they were used to infiltrate German lines by, for example, um, to get behind the lines in Tobruk, these special interrogation group Jews pretended to be uh, Africa Corps um, commandos or soldiers taking British prisoners to a prisoner of war camp. So they would take the British Air Service in trucks or the Long Range Desert Group folks in trucks who would be posing as prisoners of war, including bandages and everything else. And the German Jews would be pretending to take them captive. And that's how they got behind the lines and raided many German airfields and infiltrated Tobruk and so forth. So it was a pretty wild period during the war in North Africa. Who dreamed up this idea? I mean, yeah, it's a really interesting. There are so many clever and unexpected operations in World War II, many of which we've only found out about in recent years. The fellow who dreamed this up was a ba man named Captain Bertie Buck. He was a British commando from, from uh, Middle East Commando. And he was a young man. He was 25. He spoke multiple languages, fluent German. 
he was captured near Tobruk on an airfield raid, and he uh, escaped by killing his driver, his German driver. They were taking him off to execute him. He killed his German driver, took his uniform, and walked all the way back to British lines. And he realized when he did that that he had an idea that if he could put together a group of commandos, sort of a dirty dozen, there were actually 40 of them, uh, that he could do this as a habit, uh, get through German lines wearing a German uniform. And he was so bold, Bertie Buck. He had, he had a partner named David Russell who spoke six languages as well. And the two of them, after they trained these special interrogation group young men, the two of them, Buck, Russell, and three of those commandos to prove how good they had become at being Germans walked into a German army camp. The three younger men got on the paymaster's line to get paid. And Bertie Buck and David Russell went into the officer's mess and had lunch with a bunch of Nazi officers. That's how good they were. And once they had done this, they had proven to higher command that they could pull this off. And then they started to operate. A very dramatic opening scene. Uh, you want to sort of walk us through it? We can't do spoilers, but we could certainly talk about it. <laughs> My opening scene is the the, the main character, uh, Bernard Froelich, who is also actually based on another uncle of mine, but uh, the opening scene, he has walked across the desert for about 300 miles after having um, escaped from a German prisoner of war camp. And um, if, if I may, I'll tell you a story about how I wrote that. The opening line of the book is, in the Sahara, the sun could make a man bleed. Well, when I was an Israeli paratrooper in 1978, I had been in for about 14 months. And we had to do something called a beret march. To acquire your red beret, which was the honor of the unit, you had to walk a long distance. In my case, it was supposed to be 82 kilometers. My captain got lost. It turned into 93. But we started at the Mediterranean in a place called Julis, a tank base, and we walked to Jerusalem, and it was all uphill. So I was 25 years old at the time. The other fellows were 19. I was an, an old man. And we left after dark, and I was wearing, what was I carrying? I was carrying a helmet, 300 rounds of ammunition, a submachine gun, two hand grenades, a smoke grenade, a combat knife, two canteens, uh, another 300 rounds of ammunition on my back. So it weighed about 70 pounds, a little more than what half of what I weighed at the time. So this took from after dinner on one night until the afternoon of the next day. By 10 o'clock in the morning, it was like Arizona, 80-something degrees. By noon, it was over 100. Um, by 4 o'clock, our machine gunner passed out. He was a big boy. We had to carry him. And as we got up the last hill in Jerusalem, I realized that the skin on my face from the sun, which was so hard and hot, was fried like a chicken on a spit. It had, the skin had fried on my face. And somebody cracked a joke, and I laughed. And then one of my mates said to me in Hebrew, Steve, I think you're weeping blood. And from that line, 35 years later, from his comment, I wrote, in the Sahara, the sun could make a man bleed. So. Maybe a brutal climate, although I'm trying to remember what it was. Was it your book? Something? Oh, no. It was talking to National Geographic has a beautiful book out for Christmas called Treasures of Egypt. And um, doing an event with the editor of this book. Just they, bought it. Oh, wonderful. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. And I've been there, but we didn't go out into the desert. But they have actually shown now that there are some um, deep water sources in the desert west of Egypt going, you know, across. And therefore, there are oases that have a constant supply of fresh water, mm -hmm. you know, which all seem kind of like mythology, but turns out to be. It's true. Really, yeah, really true. Um, but, you know, and so people did actually live out there for millennia that we didn't even think was possible. Mm -hmm. But when you were doing these walks, I'm assuming that the characters, they didn't have any kind of map or any sort of, you know, knowledge no. about where they might find water. 
No, they didn't. And, and, and a lot of these, many of the things in this book, which are based on true events, when you read the true events, like that, that some of these commandos survived the things they survived is unbe unbelievable. There was a, a British SAS commando named Jack Siletto. He was a corporal. And he was part of a four-man special air service team that was raiding a German airfield near Tobruk. And they got into a gunfight, and he got separated. And Jack Saletto walked 180 miles through the desert with a compass, half a, half a canteen of water, which is gone very quickly, and a pistol, and survived it. And so these stories feed, this, these real stories feed fiction, for me at least, um, because they're so, uh, they're almost unbelievable, but they're, they're all true. So I mix them together with my own experience so I can get the color and the smell and the feel. And There you are. So for those who don't know, where is Tobruk and why was it important strategically? Tobruk is on the northern coast of Libya. Um, and it was the only... Uh, Saltwater seaport, major seaport, and that part of the war in the northern coast of North Africa, and both the, the Allies and the Germans were constantly fighting over it because they needed it to bring in fuel supplies, men, and so forth. And so Tobruk changed hands three times between 1941 and 43, and there were battles fought over it constantly. So what was Alexandria? Was it German-occupied? I mean, because Alexandria is a major port. Alexandria was not German-occupied because Alexandria uh, um, was British-occupied at the time. So the line, um, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the uh, Egyptian territory had been pushed back toward Cairo by the Germans, and it, that would also change hands often. But um, uh, the Germans, in that part of the, of the desert, the Germans and the Allies only had that one access from southern Europe to bring in supplies and men to, to that and theater. So if they decided that the way into Europe was to go up through Sicily and then go up through Italy, which is in fact what, That's they, what did they did do in 1943, then Tobruk would have been essential to that. And they, and they took it back. The Allies finally took it back, and the only way... It was, the on, it was not the only place they could debark from to go to Sicily, but they needed Tobruk, and they got Tobruk just before they got El Alamein. And, and they pushed Rommel back over, over the sea. So why, why was Rommel in Africa anyway? We tend to think of it as a European war. So what was the African theater all about? You know, I think Hitler decided that, I mean, as he often did, he made a capricious decision that Africa was important to the Germans. Well, maybe it wasn't so capricious because of the rare minerals and so forth that he could acquire there if they conquered all of Africa. They were fighting in more southern parts of Africa for a long time before the major battles in, the, in North Africa. Um, <clears throat> for example, um, Ethiopia was to the Italians what um, the Spanish Civil War became to the Germans. So I think, I'm not sure exactly what his strategic thinking was about North Africa, if there was strategic thinking, but he wanted all of it and probably a lot for its resources. That makes perfectly good sense. I mean, Italy, as you point out, had Ethiopia. So, But Germany never had a big colonial presence in Africa, no. unlike um, Britain and unlike France and, sadly, unlike Belgium. They did not. The Belgian Congo was such a brutal area. So I've, I've often wondered, you know, why he was there. Sure, there was a lot of... I mean, the Egyptians actually had to go up the Nile, um, and all of their gold and minerals and the whole bit came from Nubia, which is now known as Sudan. Um, but Egypt didn't have a, a huge amount of strategic ore and so forth. I don't know. Do you think it maybe it was his obsession with um, the Egyptians and the pyramids and all that sort of thing? No, I think he was, well, obviously he was a nutcase. We all know that. But, I mean, why did he go to Russia? You know, I mean, talk about, did he never read history and see what <laughs> Napoleon worst, about that? The worst strategic the two, decision ever. The two ever. of them, just like it was like, you know, a self-inflicted wound. I mean, I have no idea why Napoleon went. But with Hitler in particular, and it's the same question I had about our war in Afghanistan. If if they conquered it, what were they going to do with it? How in the world was Napoleon going to cover Russia from Paris 
And how did Germany it was closer from Berlin? So that made a little more sense. But how did they think they were actually? It's the same question I have with Putin in the Ukraine. Does he really think that he's going to be able to, you know, pacify it and govern it? I don't know. They say never invade Russia in the winter when your supply lines are long. Well, that's true. You know, but I just find it fascinating that these two what look like invincible um, commanders, you know, two invincible armies, 100 years apart, 100 and more than that, but not a lot more, both decided to go to Russia, and that did them in. And just like all those armies went to Afghanistan and failed, the Russians, the Brits, everybody. Yes. Afghanistan is known as the graveyard of empires. Exactly. Right. But anyway, I have no idea why, why Hitler why Rommel and all was in Russia. Rommel was a brilliant tactician and a brilliant general, and it seemed to me he was wasted in in Africa, and he might actually have been able to do something he with might Russia. Have. He was totally, he was almost wasted on every front that Hitler sent him to, and he, he would, he, well, he did very well in North Africa um, initially, and the only thing that did him in was, again, supply line problems. He couldn't get the oil that he needed for his tanks, but Everything that he proposed or wanted to do strategically was turned down by the high command. I mean, he had the same issue in, in Normandy. He he was fairly convinced that the Allies were going to come ashore where they came ashore, and nobody would listen to him. So, And he died sort of a tragic death. So, um, But that was a terrific con that Bill, uh, that, what's his name, Ben McIntyre wrote about. Do you all know about that wonderful story? The British, it was Ian Fleming, as a matter of fact. No wonder he went on to write James Bond books actually came up with a plan to take a corpse and uh, dress it up in such a way and put it out to sea from Spain into the Mediterranean to convince the British that the Allies were going to land not in Normandy, but east. Correct. And, he, and, and they did it, and indeed the body floated over, and indeed they bought it. Um, and as a result, D-Day was not as big a slaughter and was successful as it would have been yeah, it's uh, an amazing if the story. Germans had actually been prepared. I know, but I mean, you know, it's almost like I, I was amazed to see not long ago there's a woman who actually has written, because there's a ton of historical World War II books out right now. The market is saturated with them. That the British actually hired a woman who was a magician from Michigan to come, I'm serious, <laughs> to come over and, you know, dream up some of these scenarios. And that's what Fleming was really good at. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it was a war a war waged on many fronts, but imagination had had a role. Absolutely. And that 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 operation, I think it was called mincemeat, was really amazing. They they pill, p took a corpse, a British corpse, and they dumped him off the coast of Spain, I think it was, or was it Portugal? Portugal, but then he ended up in Spain and the... They had to move him from Portugal to Spain right. and get and it he accepted. Had phony papers on him. Yep. And, uh, he did. The whole bit. I mean, it was just a brilliant pretty play. Wild. So in your book, tragically, um, tell us about what happens when this, some of these men go to Tobruk because it looks like they're going to be successful in their operation. And then it all goes. This is all in the front of the book, so we're not spoiling it. Yeah, we're not spoiling it. Well, Tobruk was sort of a tragedy for a lot of a lot of the Allied troops who who tried to take it back from the Germans. And there was one larger operation in which these boys were involved, where the British were going to land land commandos ashore, and the Special Air Service was going to go into Tobruk, and they were going to raid the Italian guns, and the entire thing failed. And many well-known British commandos were killed. <clears throat> Colonel Hazelton disappeared. He was killed. Uh, Bertie Buck was captured uh, and went to a German prisoner of war camp. He was German prisoner of war for three years. Uh, David Sterling, the commander of the SAS, was eventually captured as well. And a lot of these, these special interrogation group commandos were captured and killed or executed. And a few of them survived. So in, in my book, without spoiling it, um, the survivors of this, and Froelich is one of them, go on to be part of the, the nascent X troop, which was another group of uh, commandos from, from the 50th commando, from, from number 10 commando. And they also became uh, special at infiltrating behind the lines and using their, their German uniforms and their, and their German language skills. So commandos were kind of a new idea because, you know, the British believed in more gentlemanly warfare, which is why they got slaughtered in the First World War. Um, so there was a lot of resistance to the idea of commandos. It wasn't like the done thing. 
Um, I just did an event at five o'clock with two military fiction guys, Tom, the Mark Cameron writing Tom Clancy, yes. and a new author for the Men of War system for W. E. B. Griffin named Peter Kersenoff. And um, they, Peter, did a brilliant job because he sets his book in 1943, but he starts it in 1940, and it's in Poland. Uh, where terrible things happen. But anyway, he talks about the fact that it was so hard to get the higher-up people to accept the idea of commandos, people who are not in the normal, you know, military command, didn't go to Sandhurst, you know, didn't do all that, but they were sneaky guys, they were thugs, they were assassins, they were, you know, performing um, the sort of Operation Mincemeat kind of thing. And that was a whole new war fair concept for the British. It was considered very ungentlemanly. Exactly. It was the way um, uh, um, even in American history when when our first uh, uh, rangers were brought into play in, during the, the revolution and were sniping from the woods they were considered to be, you know, brigands and renegades because they weren't standing in a line and, and, and fighting like men. So during World War II, the idea that that these special operators, these special commandos, would do dastardly things with knives and guns behind the lines, often in somebody else's uniform, was considered very ungentle, ungentlemanly. And and the fellow who convinced Churchill, and the way he convinced Churchill to to support and and um, field the SAS was David Sterling, the Special Air Service uh, originator. He was only 25 at the time, and these were young men. And David Sterling, the way he got Churchill to agree to this was by taking Randolph Churchill on a commando raid. The commando raid failed, but Randolph Churchill had such a great time that he went to Winston and said, I think this is a lovely idea. <laughs> and that's how the SAS was formed. Amazing. Right. Okay. So anyway, why don't you why don't you set the story? We've talked a little bit about it, but you know, we we open it up with this man who's made this tremendous trick trip across the desert. Um, then what? Well, he, he Froelich walks out of the desert after he was supposed to be executed, but without giving the whole story away, also based on a true event, he's saved by Erwin Rommel the famous general, German general. And that's based on a true story of George Lane, whose life was saved by having tea with Erwin Rommel. He was captured. He was a Jew. He was in German uniform. He was captured, and, and Rommel wanted to speak to him and decided not to execute him. Why did Rommel want to speak to him? He was curious. Oh, okay. I mean, Rommel was a very interesting character. He, he was not your, what you think of as your typical you know film nazi he was a he was a he was a warrior scholar and when he had a lot of respect for his enemies so he interviewed this fellow george lane whose real name was lozny i believe and then george went to a pow camp and escaped so that's also part of my the frolic story without giving too much away he gets captured all of his friends are executed he winds up in a pow camp um and uh, he escapes. So now we have the centerpiece of the book, which is when he winds up, he's very badly wounded, and he winds up in Sicily in a monastery. And the monastery is a f an American field hospital. And so the centerpiece of the book is how he recovers and who he meets there and has a romance there. And that monastery is run by an American captain surgeon who's also based on an uncle of mine who did exactly that during World War II. And then I can't tell you the rest of it because it really gives it away, but he, Froelich has a whole series of, of Odyssean adventures through which he learns that uh, the suffering that he's endured as a refugee, as a Jew, his parents have been killed and so forth, has some purpose for his growth as a, as a man, and he has to face these things and why he has become who he is and, and what he has to do to redeem not only himself, but to, but to redeem his family and, and get the revenge that he sort of seeks. But his revenge is not wild. It's, it's operational, and he's doing something for a cause that he believes will liberate Europe from the Nazis. So you have some remarkably um, 
vivid babble scenes, but one of the most vivid parts of the book is when he is being transported on a hospital ship to Sicily because he's been wounded. And the ship, um, there's a, well, you describe it. True story. Uh, in my book, it's called, the ship is called the Kensington. It was a British hospital ship. Now, British hospital ships were painted white with red crosses all over them, uh, which meant that they were not supposed to be attacked by the Germans. The Germans saw that as a very lovely target. So on many occasions, uh, Allied hospital ships were bombed by the Germans. In this particular case, true story, on which I base the fictional aspect of it, uh, the Newfoundland um, was bombed in the invasion of Italy and totally everybody was, a lot of the nurses, it was full of doctor, doctors and nurses, they were all killed. Um, and there was, there was only one patient on board at the time, and in my case I make him frolic. But that, that whole event is also a true event, and the ship... Uh, was destroyed, and it was in such bad shape that the British themselves sunk it. They took off all the survivors, and a destroyer sunk the ship because it was useless. And this was a habit of the Germans. This was not a one-off sort of accident. They did it on purpose. So that's a central part of his survival story when he finally arrives in Sicily after these horrific events, and the centerpiece is when he's, he's getting to find himself in that hospital. Could you have written all these battle scenes and so forth if you hadn't had actual military experience? Not this way. I, I think, I mean, I think that, and, and I'm sure you do too, that the best writing, the best military writing is usually by people who've had some sort of experience doing it. But just like the best crime police writing is usually by... What, criminals? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, perhaps, but... Um, Actually, to be really fair, and I, I said that to be amusing, but nonetheless, um, I've run across many authors of crime fiction whom I've said could easily have been career criminals because uh, their ability to think up, you know, cons and, and all the rest of it, um, if they didn't choose to be authors, they could actually choose they to be, actually do, yes, successful criminals, job. yeah. I know. Um, I think it's true, but I think um, that, that there's an authenticity there. But I think the military, the actual service. And the other thing is that if you're writing military fiction, the one thing you can't get wrong is weaponry. You can, you know, if you're writing a cozy crime, you can't kill a dog. But if you're writing military fiction, you can't put a silencer on, you know, the, the wrong... On a revolver. <laughs> yep, um, exactly. And, um, you know, the, it's really... You really do have to know what you're doing if you're going to delve into weaponry and battle tactics. You can't just like make it up. Yeah, I think you have to know. You have to know the details, but you also it helps it an awful lot if you've smelled it and you've heard it and you've felt it. And or if you if you're writing about, you know, police work, if you've been a police officer, just like anything else. I mean, we, I think we all like to read books by at least fiction books by people who have some some connection to the background and you can feel it you can when you read it you you can feel whether or not they know what they're talking about or they're making it up although i'm sure that there are some people who can do it very very well without the experience don't you think oh yeah no absolutely it depends on how much work you want to put into it of the two gentlemen i talked to at five o'clock one of them has been a u.s marshal and his served in the military, and the other one is a lawyer, but he's a dedicated historian, so his writing really comes from research and so forth rather mm -hmm. than tactical experience. I mean, there was a time when most men had served in the military in one capacity or another in this country, but that's not been true now for a long time. Right. And and I, I think that... But in Israel, doesn't everybody, don't yes. all men have to take a turn in the military? Yes. And... Um, you know, I think, Barbara, that you can do an awful lot with great research, but there's a, there's, a, and, and there, there's research sub substitution. Like we know that there are people who, if they want to write a certain subject, they may not be a doctor, but they'll go spend three weeks in a hospital. Um, 
if they if they want to write about you know something about a warship, they don't have to have been a sailor on a warship. But if they go spend some time at sea and and they can arrange to do something like that, it helps a great deal in the writing if you can, you know, you feel the textures of it and so forth. Um, my personally, I find it very difficult to write about something about a place I haven't been to, or about something I haven't done. So um, I usually go wherever it is that you know, my books take place in, and uh, almost all of them, if I can. I mean, COVID was a little tough, but, uh, and I try to write about things that I know about personally. Yeah, we've talked about all the military stuff, but you'll be happy to know there's a romance in this book. Um, and um, I'm trying to think, what else? Um, there's a certain amount, of, well, We've already talked about spies and subterfuge and possible traitors and all the rest of it. So, you know, in its way, it's a crime novel. And in a way, it's military fiction. Um, and in a way, it you know, it's a sort of a romance. I don't think we could really call it a romance. But, but there definitely isn't a relationships in it that are important. Yeah, it has, a, it has a very solid romantic heart to it in the middle, just like life does. I mean, I, you know, if you're writing properly about war you're not just writing about soldiers and killing and so forth because you're writing about people so i i have i have sort of a a mantra that i don't write war stories i write stories about people that happen to take place during times of war because i'm much more interested in the characters and the people than i am the guns and the bullets and all that sort of thing so yeah there's a there's a pretty solid romantic center to it yeah. There really is, and there, there's a lot of books about, you know, there were some amazing romances that happened sometimes between enemies, ostensibly. There are a number of books set in France where, you know, the German soldier and the French woman and so forth, sometimes they were forced into a relationship, but sometimes, you know, they just got attracted because they were all there together. Um, you know, I think I mean, we're, we don't talk as much about the Pacific Theater but there was, you know, and that wouldn't have been Japanese women and because they were back in Japan. As far as I know, there weren't Japanese women of any number on any of the islands and so forth. But then you'd have Americans, um, you know, women serving, men serving, or other, you know, people from other countries. And then you'd wind up with romances, most of which were doomed to fail. Do you remember South Pacific? Oh, so yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, there's a great example of it. Oh, yeah. so well. Yeah, Mary Just Martin it. singing it, and you know Ezio Pinza and the whole bit. But and it was a, it's a Mishner novel, isn't it? Yes. Didn't Mishner write South Pacific? Yes, absolutely. I think he did. Right. Tales of the South Pacific. Yeah. So you know it happened everywhere in wartime with, um, you know, extra hormones and extra adrenaline and people separated from their normal lives and all. There were all kinds of all relationships. Kinds. You all know, kinds. some of them purely sexual, some of them you know, with much more feeling involved in it. So, you know, it's a it's a rich stew in which to dip your authorial oh, yeah, you pen. get all those stories about Hemingway at war during World War II gallivanting around Paris and making all sorts of trouble with various women. So Hemingway did that his entire life. Yeah, I don't true. think that the war had that much to <laughs> had do with it. Nothing to do with the war. No. Right. Oh, starting by any you read the Paris wife, you know, it starts right there. Yep. And um yeah. Um, I don't think he's a great example. No, probably not. <laughs> Sorry. Probably but, not. <laughs> right. Anyway, um, it, it, it's a fascinating period to write about. It's almost like World War II, having survived it, is a gift that goes on giving to writers because there, there are endless facets of it that we keep learning about. I remember when, um, oh, what is his name? It's, I'm blanking on it. Wrote a book about Swiss, the Swiss gold. You know the way the the way the Swiss performed in the war, mm -hmm. and then there are stories about how the Catholic clergy, Catholic clergy, helped Nazis escape, and you know what is the, what was the role of the Pope, and then you know on, on, lately there have been all these women's stories. Um, there's a very good one I did some months ago about people from Guernsey. And when the Nazis came to Germ to Guernsey, which is an, the cha one of the Channel Islands, they're actually, I think, British. But the Germans got that far. They did. They did take Jersey and Guernsey, and I can't remember the name of the other island. Um, anyway, but they they didn't make it to Southampton. But um, 
it's a novel about the children were evacuated from Guernsey, those parents who wished to send their children to safety in England. By then, the Blitz had kind of died away. I, I don't think people are even aware of how much the war actually touched American shores. For instance, I just yeah. did uh, the um, History Book Festival in, in Lewis, Delaware. And Lewis, Delaware was a huge, um, they had a huge base there, um, an underground base where they had gigantic um, ship cannons facing the sea. They had 2,500 uh, army personnel underground in Lewis, and they could see the they could see the merchant ships being sunk by the U-boats every night right off the shores of the United States. And at the end of the war, a U-boat captain took his entire U-boat and came right into Lewis and parked it at the dock, and they all surrendered. And then those Germans first went to POW camps. But afterwards, when they realized what was going on in Germany, how bad things were, they asked to stay. So many of the families in I wouldn't say many, but uh, there are a number of families in Lewis that are there are all the descendants of of U-boat, uh, you know, Nazi U-boat personnel, because they never wanted to go home, and we let them stay. So there's there's all sorts of stories going on around that. Do you all know about the German POW camp right here in Scottsdale? It was down at Papago Peak, Papago Park, opposite the Botanical Garden. And, I didn't and, know that. And I have a, we had an author named Betty Webb who's a journalist, and I edited this book when Poison Pen Press was, was still ours before we sold it. Anyway, her story, based on actual things, is that there was a, the POWs decided they would stage a break. And to do it, they constructed a boat because their theory was <laughs> that they could all get on the boat and sail down the Great Salt River, seriously, to the Gulf of Mexico. And great was their surprise when they got their boat filled and broke out of the camp. They couldn't find the Great Salt River. <laughs> was, seriously. That's a know. comedy. <laughs> well, but 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 true. I mean, there really was, you know, um, a POW camp here. Amazing. Um, and I don't know, I really don't know whether any of them stayed on or went back because conditions in Germany were terrible. I went I went to Europe for the first time in 1955 when I was a teenager, and you could still see all the the destruction and the rubble. Right. You know the Frankfurt Book Fair and all. Um, Frankfurt was sort of in ruins, and you know Versailles was a shell. They'd removed everything valuable, and they hadn't had time to put it back together. And that was 10 years after the war had ended. It was in such, but then. I've made many trips to Germany since in connection mostly with the Frankfurt Book Fair, and I have I have been to places like Ulm, where they take you through the cathedral and tell you how they took all the the um, the stained glass and the the beautiful carved um, um, choir stalls, and they buried them in sand in the basement of the cathedral to try to protect them. And then in Augsburg, we went to a place, there's um, some alm houses. I love this. They They were actually funded in something like the 14th century, and they're still there, still running on the money from the um, uh, the set of bankers in Augsburg, Germany. They're called the Augur. And there's a film there that you can watch in which they seem totally baffled as to why the Allies bombed Germany. I mean, you could tell that much of the German population was clueless throughout the war about you know, just like I'm sure that many Russians have absolutely no idea at the moment what's really going on in the Ukraine because information was controlled, totally. you know, and they, they just didn't know. They certainly didn't have what we have now in terms of information. And, that, you know, if, if, they, if they had no access to it, well, the newspapers were all written by and controlled by the Nazis. So they were hearing whatever they wanted they were. to hear and not hearing what they didn't want them to hear. Very true. Actually, they're called the Fugerite. You should look them up. I think there was a, a Europe was very good, and the British did it too. Their idea of a social welfare network was to have almshouses, and you qualified for living there if you, you know, were basically destitute mm -hmm. or old, or I don't know. There were various standards. And I think it's astonishing that the Fugerite still, and you walk into it, and and because I try to finally figure it out. The, the houses have little, um, like British pubs, they have little signs or they have something hanging down from them, like a, a key or a, a hammer or something. And, 
you know, that's the address of the house. It's, you know, the hammer on the right or something. And I'm going, why? And then I suddenly realized that this was an entirely preliterate, you know, uneducated population in the 13th or 14th century that were living there. So the only way they could figure out, because the houses were all identical, just like Sun City or whatever. So the only way they could figure out which house was theirs was to put some sign that indicated either a profession or oh, interesting. whatever. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really fascinating. But what's amazing is that it survived because so much of Germany actually did get flattened. Oh, it was... Kind of revenge for Coventry in a way. It was devastated. It was devastated. And I think a lot of the Germans, the way they began to realize what was really happening during the war was when their sons started coming home from the various fronts and telling them. Um, I know that... Uh, the Germans had no idea what was going on on the Russian front until their sons started to come back. And and some of the sons were serving in units like the Einsatzgruppen and so forth. And they were saying to them, you know, everyone knows what we bring. And the parents couldn't believe what their kids were doing out there. So that's how they found out what the dark side of, of, of what was happening in Nazi Germany. I'll talk about hubris. If you go to St. Petersburg, they will tell you, they will show you there's a very fancy hotel there, and Hitler had it all picked out for his victory lunch. I mean, he was ready to mm -hmm. come to St. Petersburg and do that. So, yeah. you know, the whole thing was amazing. It didn't work out that way. Yep. So, questions? Any of you like to ask um, Stephen about any aspects of the book? <laughs> it is. It is. It, um, and he's not a very happy fellow, is he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I did do it on purpose as sort of a counterpoint. Yeah. Uh, this book took me about three years. No. I um I write every book by hand first, pencil and notebook, because I I I sort of um, it feels more like sculpture to me the first time around. It, if I take more time with the pencil, if I write that way, um, then it, it's I'm, I'm taking uh, you know it feels like I'm developing it more slowly, but it's more. Um, tactile, it has more character to it. And then the second revision, I put it onto the computer. It looks like four hours of me sitting there with my head in my hand. <laughs> no, I can write about, I write, I can write fiction about four or five hours a day. I, I don't believe in writer's block. Even if I feel like I'm not sure where to go. I will sit there until I come up with some place to go. Even if it's not good, I'll fix it later. Um, I'm, I believe in the Hemingway School, which is that you always stop writing at night when you know what you're gonna, how you're going to start the next day rather than completing all your thoughts. So you leave yourself an opportunity to sit down and start right away. And those four or five hours go like that. I start with an outline. My very first agent was Al Zuckerman from Writer's House. Right. And Al, when he took me on, I was a young writer. He saw my first manuscript, and he said, You're, you know how to write, but you know nothing about writing a novel, kid. And he taught me how to write from an outline. Um, and if you have an outline as an author, not everybody does it, but I do. Because if I have an outline for a work of fiction, I always know where I'm going. And if you just write it from the seat of your pants, you can get lost. So I never get lost. It's a long journey, but that's how I do it. For this book, no, I have an agent who does that. The first time I was ever published, I had to get it. My first project was getting an agent. That's what took most of the time was acquiring a good agent and once I had one the agent takes it to the publishers I don't do that anymore thank heavens I don't have to do that anymore. actually publishers only work with agents now the right. major publishers they don't work directly with authors so they're complicated contracts and it's just easier for 
for them to do that. Um, the hard part sometimes is to match up an author with an editor. Is you get, if you wind up in a relationship, an editorial relationship, that doesn't work, it can really be awful. Correct. So who, who is your editor, which is actually? My current editor is a wonderful man named Peter Joseph. He's at, uh, Har he's, he's at um, Hanover Square Press, which is a division of Harcourt Brace and Harlequin. And he and I happen to like the same kind of writing and the same kind of stories, so I'm very lucky to be with him. But as Barbara says, there are there are times when writers get stuck with editors or editors get stuck with writers and they just, you know, it's oil and water. But I've been very lucky. Every editor I've ever had has been really good. And somebody, But, you know, usually editors will acquire you because they like your writing style, so it's not a fight. Well, usually they do. But what really happens sometimes is that um, uh, an editor leaves the publisher for one reason or another and then you get stuck with the replacement who didn't buy happened. you and doesn't care anything about you. And, you know, there have been some some really unhappy. And then there are also authors who have followed editors. James Lee Burke, if you know his work, has followed, I think, three, his editor through three different, or did. I mean, I think that, I don't even know if the editor's still working, three different publishers in order to stay with the editor. Yeah, actually, Peter... Uh, he was at St. Martin's. Exactly. He was at St. Martin's. And when he wanted this book, he said, I will be leaving, so wait. Uh, let's wait. Because I wanted, he and I wanted to work together. So he moved over and started his own imprint. And that's when The Soul of a Thief, which is sort of the prequel to this, uh, came out about four years ago. And now I'm working on the third part of this series. Kind of a trilogy? Yeah, it's a trilogy. The same character? Well... It will have all of the, the characters from The Soul of a Thief wind up appearing right. at the back of this, and then all of these characters will wind up in the third book with new people as well. The surviving characters. The surviving characters. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that that the thing about a series, if it has the same protagonist, is that that protagonist is never really going to be in jeopardy. Right, because that'd be Jack Reacher is not going to be killed in a Jack Reacher book. Yeah, you that's just true. know that, um, and it's it can be much more exciting when you read a book like this and you don't know who's gonna who's gonna survive. Everybody's in jeopardy, really. Correct. You know, so you have to take the survivors and move them forward. The survivors, yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Both. Yes, you're uh, you're exactly on it. I mean, you don't have to do deep research to do the outline. That's a plot mechanism. But once I start getting into the book, if there's research that I need to do, then I go deep. And that does take up a lot of time. Your, your days are not always writing days. To do the Sicily thing, I went to Sicily and stayed at that monastery. Um, so that's how I made sure that, that that part of the book looks and feels real. And um, sort of a quick interesting story about that monastery is that I plucked that out of the internet. I wanted a certain look, so I plucked this monastery in Agrigento, in Sicily, just out of the internet, and I decided it was going to be a field hospital. Then I went there, I stayed there, I sort of made friends with the, the nun who takes it's it's actually a b and b as well they've got six it's a beautiful place and i asked her on my second day i said what happened here during world war ii she says it was an american field hospital so i knew i was in the right place so that's how i, I the outlines don't need deep research but afterwards i do deep research and if you're asking in terms of which you should do first, it generally is better to plot out your story and research the things you need. Because if you start the other way and you do all the research, it's very hard to let it go. And then your so book true. Jerk, no, it really is. So you know, true. we've had endless discussions with authors over this subject. So you know, you don't need to know the entire history in order, as you say, to create your plot. But once you have your plot, then you can right exactly you can do the relevant history. That's what editors do. They chop out all that stuff you don't really need in the book, but breaks your heart if you went to all the trouble. That's to why learn I try it. to chop it up before it gets to him. <laughs> That's right, indeed. Was there a question from the online audience? I saw you over there. Finally, sorry. Exactly. So, uh, somebody online would like to know: Your books are required reading now. There is no 
Okay. Um, what type of honor, what's that like, obviously, to be a required uh, youth for the military? And uh, is there any particular book that you're thinking of? They're not required, they're recommended. <laughs> no, it's good. And that happened because I wrote a book with a fellow named Mike Durant about um, Mogadishu called In the Company of Heroes. And that's the thing that triggered the, the command and general staff college to recommend my that book and the rest of my works for, you know, military reading. Not so much the fiction, although I've been recommended for that as well. But then we wrote another book called The Night Stalkers, um, which is about army aviation. And so a lot of what I write, and I also ran a magazine for six years called Special Operations Report, which a lot of, you know, Army folks read and Air Force folks and special operators and so forth. So it, it's, it's, it's something to be recommended. I know. It's, it's that time of year. <laughs> right. Is anyone else? Did you have a question, sir, or are you just scratching your nose? <laughs> My favorite book of nonfiction uh, military is in the Company of Heroes, and um, right now this is my favorite fiction. So, <laughs> love the book you're working on. Most authors actually like the book, not this book, but the book they're actually now writing. No, I hate that one <laughs> because that's the pain. That's the hard one. <laughs> no, but that's the one also that's still perfect. No, that's true. Absolutely true. <laughs> that's the thing. The next know? book is always perfect. Right. That's right. So I did actually have my own question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, which is, what's one of the things that struck me about your writing uh, is that it's very visceral. It really, you do dive into the feeling. I mean, you, you give a, a glimpse of it when you talk about the, the opening scene of this. I've read other authors who have military experience writing military books, and one insurance agent from Maryland who was very successful. Um, I've heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> um, they don't seem to, to reach as easily, or I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy, but to reach as often that, that deep level of experience. And so when you're writing it, you've experienced it, they've experienced it. What do you think helps you really sort of dig down into what the characters are feeling and, and make that such a vibrant scene? Is it, is it all of you, go ahead. Uh, I think it's because I'm not afraid of it. I think a lot of military writers, if they've had military experience, have a lot of tightness about expressing what's really deep, and I don't have that. Um, <clears throat> so when I write about these things, I pretty much, what do they say, Barbara? Open a vein, right? Mm -hmm. You really got to open a vein and just bleed on the page. And it's, it's hard for a lot of people to do. I'm fortunate I can do that, and not all writers can do it. Um, so that's probably what you're what you're feeling when you, you know, I'll say it, even if it's tough. And then as you write it, are you revising sentences and making them more descriptive over, over edits, or do you find that it kind of just comes out that way more or less the first time? Um, it doesn't just come out that way. It's that, that first, you know, pencil to paper sentence is the hardest. Fixing it later, later and making it a little bit more visceral or a little bit more visual or, or changing words and so forth is not as hard as the first um, sort of scratch of the scalpel. It's also true that you see it differently. If you write it by hand, I've, I've had this experience. I've edited hundreds of books and talked to authors about this. If you write it down, it's... You see it differently when you when you type it and you and it shows up on the screen, and flaws in the in the th are much more apparent. But it also can work in the reverse. I find I always print out manuscripts and edit them on paper. So if I, I try too. to edit them on screen, um, I don't see things as clearly. So that back and forth process can actually help you. In the same way, same thing. Anybody else? 
Well, thank you very much for your attention. If you would like Stephen to sign a book for you, that would be lovely, or maybe he's already done that. Let me wish you a very happy holiday, and thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you, Barbara. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. You thank you. You want to just stay here because it's a good surface. Do you need a pen? Sure. Got a pen?